Hey, we are yeah, so. back with, with the Who's Your Band podcast, and we have a great one for today. But right before we get started with that, I'm sitting here with my buddy, Sean Morton. Hi, Jeffrey. Hello, Sean Morton. Hey, I was thinking about you uh, this Naked week. Naked in the shower. Uh, I wish. <laughs> um, two of your favorite things I saw. Your favorite brand, Primus, is oh, doing- them. Yeah, they're doing farewell to Kings. Oh be, yeah, Primus doing, they're, they're, is doing a rush, a rush tribute. Well, show. I know how much you like both bands. Yeah, I'd rather blow my brains out than go to that show. <laughs> oh, I, I, well, I got you some tickets, so I think maybe did you? Yeah, oh, you great. and I will go. We'll, oh, we'll have a good yeah, time. I'll, I'll be right enjoying there. Primus I'm that night. doing a whole rush set. Yeah, but um, enough of. Uh, this tomfoolery. Let, let's yes. get right into it because we, we got have a, we, great guests. Great tonight. guests, jam packed show, and uh, I'm sitting here with Don Jameson. Hello, Don. Hi. <laughs> you actually came up on a previous episode of our podcast. Uh oh. You really did. What was her name, and what did she claim I did? Well, we weren't sure if she actually was a woman, but wow. um, for anybody who doesn't know, Don was one of the former hosts of that metal show on VH1 oh. Classics. That I that I, that I will admit it, to. Thir- Thirteen seasons. 14. 14. Get it right, Morton. Wow. 14 seasons. You don't see a lot of people get no. that, that long of a, of a run that with the show. That was a great run, man. And I love the show. Every episode was fantastic. Yeah, they were great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And, uh, Those are good. phenomenal. Blessed to have that kind of a run. Thanks. Phenomenal stand-up comedian. And uh, our other guest... <laughs> Cassidy Cananzaro? Yes. Am I saying it right? Yeah. Yeah, Cass- good. Can- Cassidy Leave Cananzaro. Leave it to a Jersey guy to get that right, though. Staten Island guy. But, you know, don't, don't, don't put me in the same category. Jersey, right. you're going to cover charge. We're it's in Jersey, case. though, so yeah. we have to learn uh, how to pronounce it. Former lead singer of Antigone Rising. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. now, now yeah. doing solo. Yeah, I'm doing okay. my own thing now. So we're excited to have both of you guys in here today. <laughs> and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk and we'll, get, we'll say some stuff. So let's start with uh, Don. Um, Where did you grow up, Don? Um, uh, parts unknown. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> he thinks he's like a wrestler, wrestler from the eighties. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, don't okay. to, well, I don't want people tracking me down. Um, <laughs> I grew up in I grew up in New York, in New York City. Yeah, and I've lived back and forth in New York and New Jersey my whole life. So. Where'd you go to high school? I mean, what do you Did want? You my address? You want my social security <laughs> number? <laughs> Sean, <laughs> help me out here, you work bro. For the CIA? What, he didn't you... tell me I had to like reveal all this information. That's great. What am I Wait, signing I... up for Clear at the airport? <laughs> is this TSA pre check? Why is, am why I right is this so here? sensitive right information? Wrong? Where'd you go to high school? I grew up in South Jersey at a place. In a, at a place. So you there's went, trees you in got, a street. And what, so what kind of kid were you? School. We we no. always like the rocket kid. Were you? No, pe- no. I liked uh, Japanese Glockenspiel. I, of course. I, <laughs> you know, Very I, funny. I, were, I played the Glockenspiel. <laughs> I'm so okay. happy I'm not the one beating the shit out of Jeff today. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, this is gonna be a fun episode. Usually Don I'm ready. is really nice to me. Not you know, also <laughs> today. Everyone's taking no, it. Just shot. got very personal. <laughs> you know, in this day and age of voter like. <laughs> Our um, ID, uh, what do they call it? Theft, theft. ID theft, and all. We're gonna start this again. I'm no. nervous. No, it's good. <laughs> no, okay. no, no, I, yeah, I, um, you know, since I'm 11, you know, I loved, you know, Kiss Destroyer was my first album, yes. and, yeah, and album. I never went away from that. And yeah, all through high school, there was, you know, I got into different types of hard rock and metal, and I went through all the phases. You know where I liked the heavier stuff like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden, and then I wore like the le- the, the leather and all that stuff, oh, yeah. and then Motley Crue and all those oh, the eighties. Ba- yeah, they came around. Oh, wow. So then I was wearing spandex and eyeliner, and but oh, I was you know I had the I, mullet. That's you know in Jersey if you grow up in Jersey, you know that's right, right. a law. Uh, you have to have a mullet and hang out at the mall, and that's now, what I did. When you when you're high school. Did you do like the whole like Jersey club scene, like going to um, what was that? What was the place in? Um, uh, there was a couple of the, like the Colonel's Garter. There was like all those. The clubs. Birch Hill. Birch, Birch Hill was a great. Yeah, one. But what was the Play big Pen. one? Fountain Casino. That's the one I couldn't think of. Uh, did you, you did that? And- um, you know, the, I I never really did the Fountain Casino, but Birch Hill for sure. You know. Yeah. That was the place, like right in Central Jersey, yeah. where you could. And also, like I went to college at Rutgers, and. Um, and so um, it was easy to like go over the Verrazano and get to not you know back then it was like a dollar right, now it's yeah. like forty seven dollars yeah, it's like a mortgage payment to get to get over there <laughs> but yeah Sean knows we you know we used to go to Lemoore's and and go see all the bands out there so um, uh, and then New Brunswick had a, a really cool scene back then with the Core Tavern and, oh, yeah, and that all that place. place so we had some uh, and we had great rock bands come through and play. Um, at the campus and stuff. So yeah, I was never, and then I was always a record collector. We had a great record store. So um, yeah, I was always, um, you know, the music thing was just always a big part of my life, man. And the band that, that you 
love is your favorite band you said is going to be Saxon. So yeah, the band that I, I guess we're going to talk about tonight is Saxon, and um, you know not, they're not really that well known. Yeah, you could talk about them all night because I've never heard one song from Saxon. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a metal fanatic. I've never heard one song from Saxon. Denim and leather. Never brought us all together. Nope. Really? Never heard it. Yeah. No. How about Princes of Princes of the Night? Of the night. No. I just told Crusader. you. Crusader. No. Princes of the Night. What year did that the, come oh, out? That's all off of Denim and Leather, so okay. that's why, like, um, 81, 83? 82, like, 83, yeah. 83. All right, so I was it's six per- years old, I so of course I didn't. Little. Yeah, but you know I Elvis. Yeah. You had to compare Elvis to Saxon, for Christ's sake? <laughs> but, but yeah, he doesn't hold the candle. He doesn't hold the candle. I don't Saxon. know that Saxon was quite as big as Elvis Close, but not quite as big. <laughs> Saxon really was, like, like, like the King ultimate eight, they, they were the ultimate eighties metal band. Yeah, that was. Yeah, you know? they were like whole before. Genre. Yeah, they were before Iron Maiden. And, I love all and that shit. Priest, like they were bigger than priests in Europe. Where are they from? Are they, are they Europe? Are they Europe? They're, they're British. Yeah. Okay, so they're part of that whole new wave of British heavy metal kind of exactly. Scene? Okay. So so when when those albums came to America, the, oh here's the new wave of British heavy metal, and they had the compilation album in Saxon, was one of those bands, and I just always loved them, and probably because a lot of people didn't. Or just okay. didn't know that's them, cool. yeah. so you know, I, you know, that's like Motorhead, same thing. Like I took all these bands under my wing, because and, he, and Maiden too, who and I obviously ended up being humongous. But you know, I always loved that. Oh, these are my bands, right? You know, sure. Like that I could hold, and um, and then some got huge. Metallica, obviously, and yeah. you know the bands that uh, were the underground at the time, Megadeth, and all that. Yeah. Be- yeah. Some wow. became huge, and then. Yeah, Saxon had a little bit of a success in America, and I, and so my new album is based on their their album Denim and Leather. I How made a cool. Denim and Laughter. That's pretty cool. I like that. That's you know, great. and I just stole their artwork and. Uh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> My next album. Put myself on it. So. My next album is going to be called Gaga Bieber Spears. So the way anybody <laughs> Googles it on iTunes, it pops up instantly. I wish I wasn't sitting this close to you right now. It's like, it's it's, like Marilyn Manson. That's Manson's. smart marketing, smart. though. That is smart marketing. <laughs> no, the art, there's a, co- you know, the co- uh, J- Chad Zumach from Cleveland, mm-hmm. yeah. a comic friend of ours. He, he, all the tracks on one of his CDs are like Lady Gaga songs. That's it's, great. So when they Google it, it comes to his it's CD and they download brilliant. his stuff accidentally. It's really hard to get things like that, though, up on like, so CD Baby and like all the, they fight you on things like that. If they see a name that's similar, they'll, they'll take it down or they're, they're oh, really wow. weird about copywriting. That's the only thing. I wonder if he has any trouble with that. I'd be curious. Anyway. Just He's got stupid, lots of other problems. Boring He's business stuff. Comic. But we yeah, all have like all that digital stuff, it's complicated now. You know, the other thing about Saxon is like we talked about um, record stores. They had great cover art and that's something that you don't see anymore like, you know, with, with downloads. Is is a cover art. So right. if you weren't really sure, like of this band, you're like, well, they're kind of the same genre of a, of a band you may like. You looked at that cover and say, you know, I'll give them a shot. And then, you know, like you said, Crusader is a really great album, uh, great song. It, like has like one of the, you know, what? <clears throat> Saxon was kind of the one thing. The inspiration of uh, Spinal Tap. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. I know so that. yeah, so they had like they had like the, the, you know, the big sound, big introductions to Over these the songs, top, like, yeah. like yeah. rain and horses and That's stuff. Great. Yeah, really, like yeah, really very over the top. But the but the riffs are so. So catchy and, and great. I think you could see how they kind of like lead and become the inspiration to like Metallica and, and Pantera, who we talked about last time, and Megadeth, and all these other bands. I think right? that was what set those bands apart, though, the ones that really had songs you could remember, right? Because like a lot of them were cool and they all had these big guitars, but the ones that were really writing songs mm-hmm. and had cool riffs, I think those are the best ones, you know? You brought up a great point, and this is going to be leading into great. Cassidy here, um, is about the cover art. So, I can remember, it was probably 12 years ago, I was down in Atlantic City, and we were driving back, we stopped at a Starbucks, we were looking for something different. Now, as much as of a rock metal guy that I am, I also have a different side that I love, a lot of like rock and singer-songwriter stuff. Um, so one of my favorite artists is Melissa Etheridge, and I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of her, always will be. So we walked into a Starbucks and we're looking at the whole CD section and we saw a CD that had five women on the front of it. Never heard of it before. And it was a band called Antigone Rising from the ground up. So we looked at each other and said, okay, let's buy this album and listen to it. And we put it in and it really didn't leave our CD player for a few years afterwards. So yes, great cover art can lead to discovering new artists. And one of those new artists that I discovered is our guest today, Cassidy Kanzara. Yeah. Well, nice segue. Thank you're welcome. you. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that though. Just on that thought, I've had more people 
say that they bought the record because of the photo, the cover photo. There sure. was something about it that there was just, and it wasn't, it's, it was just, it was five women, but we were wearing leather jackets and t-shirts. I mean, it certainly wasn't, nowadays you have to get your ass out, you know what I'm saying? Like for anybody to pay attention to anything. It wasn't like that. We were just, you know, five women stacked on a photo, um, our faces, and people still recognize me, I think, even just from the photo. Like, how well, do it was I know different you? because you're always, you know, there's there's a million times you have one female in a band. So if you, unless you're talking about like Vixen, but there really wasn't an all female band that had broken out in no. a long time. In a long time. R- R- Vixen, Runaways. I mean, well, I'm talking yeah. about like. And like at that current. period like, of time, like, like they had the Donnas no. and they had like there were a couple of bands yeah. that they yeah, were trying like, to like, push. Like, Remember the Donnas? And they were I met those girls. They were actually really cool girls. But we were a little bit different in that. You know, it was real musicians, not to put anybody down, but we were really playing our oh, instruments. Yeah. Everybody was really good, um, accomplished. Our drummer was amazing. You know what I'm saying? We had like, we were a real band. We, you could come see us and it was like actually a show. I mean, we were going out and playing with Aerosmith and the Stones and like, you know, the Almonds were taking us out. So it wasn't like a, even though it was gimmicky because it was all women, we weren't that, we weren't like a gimmick band. Sure. And I think that sort of set us apart. So how did you get started? Where did, where did you uh, grow up? Were you Jersey? I was, I grew up in New Jersey. I grew what up in, you, what zip code? I, I'm going to tell you what my childhood house is right <laughs> now. Get the cord, I'll give you the coordinates. Uh, you, got, you got a pen, I'm going to give you the coordinates. Yeah, Je- yeah Jeffrey's collecting information. <laughs> <laughs> he's, yeah, he, yes. he's like I'll a human you, computer. I've had a On the side, I do taxes. I just want to make sure that you guys are up to code. Oh God, please don't. Not as a musician, man. <laughs> what that's like so so i grew up um in new jersey northwest sussex county uh lake mohawk up in like the lakes yeah, up there by sparta beautiful by sparta yep. beautiful um place and uh it was weird for me you know because i was sort of um i was always an artist so I, I wasn't i didn't really fit in it was very sort of academic and sports focused you know school system um and i think i knew right away that i was a little bit different so i I was i couldn't wait to get out i couldn't wait to get to the city you know so immediately when i was very young i moved to new york city um and then went out to los angeles and spent a lot of years out there but yeah like i grew up I grew up like singing in church, basically, as a little wow. girl. So yeah. who'd you wind up listening to? Like, you're look, looking at three metal heads here. Yeah, well, I think it would surprise you. I listened to metal also. Um, it was a lot of, like, my babysitters and my older, my, like, friends, older brothers and sisters listened to, like, Motley Crue and, and you know, Judas Priest and all the ones you're mentioning, Metallica and King Diamond and all of, like, the deep, yeah, all that stuff. <laughs> We loved all of that. That was what I listened to. The other thing that I listened to a lot was because of where I grew up, there was only one radio station, and it was a classic rock radio station. And it's still there, and it still plays classic rock. But we were listening to, like, Leonard Skinner and Fleetwood Mac and Joni Mitchell. And, like, I didn't know that, you know, of course, Bruce Springsteen, but I didn't know there was any other kind of music really growing up. You know, it was all guitar-driven, song-led, very, like, vocal-heavy harmonies, you know, that was what I thought was was music, and it sort of naturally took me there in in terms of the way that I wrote after. But I always loved rock bands and and rock music and like yeah, big sounds. So, who was your biggest inspiration as a band? Was was, it, was, was it my hair and Fleetwood Mac? I would say probably in the sense that. I love vocals in a band. I love having multiple instruments. I love piano and guitar and drums. I love that sort of blue-eyed soul um, sound, like the ability. What I loved about bands from that time, if you look at bands like Doobie Brothers, like Fleetwood Mac, like um, uh, uh, Little River Band even, right? You could have on an album a song that sounded a little bit more kind of soul and then a song that was more like country rock. And nobody, and you could have multiple singers too. And nobody ever thought like, well, every song needs to sound exactly the same or else we don't know what this is. We don't know what to do with it. Like there was no such thing as that. You could kind of bridge and span different genres within one band. Um, And so for me, I liked the idea of experimenting with sound like that and having big vocals, having harmonies, always having piano and guitar if we could, um, and having as many people on stage as possible. Like I just like big bands with a lot of singers and and, uh, I would say that that was it. And then later on, of course, I got more influenced like by Stevie Wonder and, and you know, all the kind of more soul stuff, but that wasn't until later. A little bit of Motown in there too. A little bit, yeah. yeah. Like later on, so you, you like you like a full sound. I do. I like Horns. I like a real band. You know, I don't. I never got into sort of using loops and and anything. You know, too any nothing that couldn't be recreated live. You See, know? Saxon didn't fuck around. 
It, they just came out there and they ripped it like from yeah. right from the beginning, man. Yeah, they, I was they never into lube either. <laughs> Not lube. Oh, Not lube. Oh, you said lube. Oh, 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 sorry oh. about that. Uh, and, and they don't think they used any lube. Elsewhere. I don't think they um, used any lube. No, and, I'm glad and I didn't a, bring any then. And that's a bit. <laughs> that's a big thing now with with bands now, especially with rock bands, is uh, the criticism of like, oh, they're using backing tracks and all this stuff and whatever. And you know, I, I say this. It's like um, we're in the day of a day and age of where people record everything, right? Yeah. So so if you're especially if you're a big band, you know, if they're gonna put that show up on YouTube five seconds after the concert's over. And so these bands want to sound good. Yeah. You know, and a lot of them are resorting to using some trickery. And, mm -hmm. you know, I got to say, I don't really blame them, you know. Like, we're comics, you know. There's no, we can't put a laugh track behind us. It, it is I'd what it to. is. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, but then, <laughs> you and they could just make a hologram of us exactly. and we have to show up. But, but for rock bands, it's very important for them to sound great because people look up the set list. And then they judge, oh, I'm not going to go this time because I don't like the set list. Or then they go, oh, I'll go and see how it sounds. Or if they hear it sounds not good on YouTube, they go, oh, I'm not going to go see it. It's really hard, man. Like anymore, it's so difficult because not only, not only is all of the technology there at your disposal, it makes it so much easier and it sounds so much better and you can tune things and you can chop things up and you can chop up performances. Like all of that's fine as long as you have the people that can deliver the goods, you know, live. But I think the biggest problem is that there's not as much money in it as there once was. So to, in money and what? In in doing music, period. Well, like, the, money, the money now is on the side of touring as opposed to making. Yes and no, music. though. Like you think that it is, you can't but make it really much as an album. Make, but to bring an album to bring six guys out on tour. It's really expensive. I mean, we were a band. You know, we were broke for a really long time. But we. But you can make it up on merch as well because now I think artists that, are getting a bigger I, piece of the merch. I think that that's what people. That's a higher think. level. A little bit of a higher level band can, can kind of squeak by that totally. way, and on uh, meet and greets and stuff. Right. And that's why this whole it's a, this is a whole other conversation. But the Brexit thing is affecting bands over there because right. lower level bands can't. Uh, in, in, in 2021 are not going to be able to tour unless they can prove they have a certain amount of money in the bank and that they're a sustainable band. And that's going to hurt a lot of bands. It is so. going to hurt a lot of bands. Well, it's, it's, be uh, it's tough across the board here, there, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. Be, to be a band starting out now, I mean, it, it's almost like college. Like You're going to have to pay, lose money, and then stick it out, and hopefully yeah. you're able to make it up you down the road. You have to imagine, right? Like, bands now are contending with the fact that there's so much – Compete. People don't want to leave their houses. They don't have to. They have computers. Sure. They have their phones. They, right. have their, but, but they didn't have that so much as when I was coming but up. There's still nothing better than seeing live music. Yeah, we, I would we're totally a different generation. You know what I'm saying? We're we, we know that. that. We know that. We yeah. know that. But I don't know that a 20 year old thinks that necessarily. Te technology. Can, Good point. Technology yeah. can really work against you too because like we've said this before. I know ahead of time if I'm going to a show and there's three bands going on ahead of time. And I don't like the two bands before that. I'm going to go right on Setlist FM. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say, okay, so Monster Magnet's playing on April 18th. And if I don't want to get there early, I want to get there when they start playing Space Lord. I can go right on there and I flip through a couple things. But of and course, you love Monster Magnet. I do. So. But I'm just using that as an example. Like, But, you know, <laughs> it's, it's also my voice. I got it. No, no, it loses, I know it loses yeah. the luster because you want to go to a show and you want to be in the moment. So first thing people are doing is taking up their phones, or if they're like 50 and 60, they take up their iPads and they're holding up oh their iPads at a concert. To do what? To tape the whole show. As opposed I, to just watching why? it. But it me, makes who me is, insane. Who is going back on, on their iPhone and saying, oh, Don, you got to see this. Watch watch this concert Nobody does it because we're so- Nobody, nobody. ever. Because we're so ingrained in How fast would you punch living? me in the face if I did that? I do this that happens. anyway. This happens. This happens. I had to watch a show recently through somebody's phone who was standing in front of me because I couldn't see the stage. It's ridiculous. Because he had his phone up. It was ridiculous. And it happens all the time. I mean, listen, I, I, I mean, I could go on and on about it, but, it, you know, in my, you didn't have to post every single thing. You didn't right. have to tell everybody every single thing about yourself. You didn't have to post every single day and talk about what you had for breakfast. You, there was mystery in our rock stars, right? You mystique. asked me, right? You asked That's me the about great thing who, about not knowing the set list, too. Well, yeah, all of it. Like, it ruins it. And it I totally feel is. like I'm frustrated by it, I have to say. I, I think that it's ruined a lot of the uh, the fun of it, a lot of the, the mystery, a lot of, you know, Pearl Jam was one of my favorite bands growing up. And 
I loved Eddie Vedder. I didn't know anything about him. You want to know what I knew about him? I knew his records, and I knew what he was saying on his records, and that was it. And you know that's still true? Absolutely. I still don't know anything about him. I know what he does publicly, Perfect. and that's it. And I'm okay with it. Like, I've never once tried to find out anything else he's about him. He's a Cubs him. fan. That's all we know. Yeah, we know. <laughs> exactly. We know he's got a, all he lets out. Maybe, yeah. like, we found out recently. I just, re- I swear to you, and I'm a big fan. I didn't even know he had kids and was, like, married to, like, remarried and had some kids. I just learned something about him. Like, yeah. like recent, which I love. That's, that's what I'm best. saying. That's right. why you come on this show. He's got like kind of grown kids. Yeah, and I love that well, I he's know that. He's got to be that. like in his fifties. He right? is sure. now. Yeah, and yeah. but like it's just but, the point that like so am I, I, I have no kids. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have any kids either. But I, I actually love that. I love not knowing things. I loved waiting for the records to come out. I loved hearing what he had to say on the records and the occasional interview. I waited for that. Now nobody wants to watch interviews or do the thing. They will. But at their own leisure, they don't have to. Do you guys remember, like, you would, like, sometimes hear, like, a concert or an interview on the King Biscuit Flower Hour? Does, oh, yeah. Yeah, remember? Yeah. Syndicated show. Yeah. yeah, of course. And you would wait, like, I think it was on, like, on a Sunday at yes. like, 11 or midnight right. or something. So or shows late. like yours, you know what I'm saying? Like, I was on the, I was on a few of those shows, too. Like, we, I did the, a lot of the I Love series on VH1. I was in a ton of those. And, yeah, like... Yeah. Any of those interview shows, like you waited for those. You waited yep. for like the new albums to come out and you guys were going to debut it or somebody was going to debut the new record and you sat in front of your television. You waited for the new video. You waited for the, that just that stuff doesn't exist anymore. I, I, was, a like gu- I was a guest on a friend's podcast a couple months ago. We were talking about concert etiquette and we talked about uh, one of the shows that I went to was the Misfits show at Prudential Center. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm not a gigantic Misfits fan, but I love the hits. You know, like everybody knows the history of the Misfits. Yeah. And, and Glenn we, loves to be photographed and yes. videoed. Well, that was the whole thing. <laughs> when you walked in, they, they checked your phone into a neoprene sleeve. They're doing this now. It's, it's, it, well, I, I, I'm a fan of it. I'm not going to lie. You. I'm a fan, of, fan of, it. of it. I'm a fan oh, of yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Yonder bags, right? There's like a new thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they're green bags and... I'll, I'll, I'll never forget this concert to the day I die because there was 19,000 people in that place. Now, granted, there were some jerks who snuck their phones in. There was about 20 or 30 phones that were out. But there was 19,000 people in the moment making a piece of history. That's what I'm like it was, it was history. Like I'll always remember that show as seeing all these people singing every word to every single song. Right, right. And just enjoying the moment. And not one of them is going back and saying, hey, do you want to hear this? Uh, no, it's horrible. I'm it, all it for that. Me, I'm, I love that. And I'm um, all for Dave it. Chappelle's doing that now in his show. He's shows. one of the ones who started it. Yeah. Right. He's one of the ones who started it. And even the Tool concert that I went to was the same way. Yep. They didn't lock them up, but they said, we catch you using your phone when you're getting thrown out. I love it. Madonna and, did it. Yeah. And it was, you know, I, I love it. And there was just people just sitting there watching the show, Thank enjoying you. it. And at the last last song Maynard goes guys you were a great audience take your phones out this one's on us and they played Stink Fist and of course like Stink. like, yeah like like programmed animals that we all are as soon as yeah. you said take our phones right. out boom everybody's phone is up like this recording that's it that's my favorite Stormy Daniels uh, film by the way Stink <laughs> Fist that's, that's a classic Stink Fist yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good one. Oh, that's really yeah, man. I, I, I'm a big fan. I love it. Their <laughs> p- comics are starting to do it. I'm 100% for it. Yeah, man. I As just performers, sing. and you just saw there's a, a, a video about of Chris Robinson with his brother doing an acoustic show for a benefit or whatever. It's just him and his brother, Rich, and they're doing acoustic songs. He's like, guys, you got to stop. You got to shut the fuck up, man. What am I allowed to say that? Yeah, yeah. You got to shut the fuck up. I can't. We're about up here. I can't even hear myself sing. You guys wow. are talking the whole time. Hey, we're happy to be here for you guys. You paid us to come here to perform for you. But man, you got to got to be quiet, man. We got to. We're trying to work up here, you know. And it's yeah. like etiquette. It, it is because nobody has etiquette anymore because they're too consumed. I got this phone and my iPad and this, and they got to say this to this guy. No. And there's no attention span, and there's no respect. Like I have to say, I feel like an old lady sometimes talking about it, but I do feel like it's something that needs to be spoken about more. And I think it's. I love that artists are taking a little bit of initiative to say, listen. Unfortunately, like what the reason we have laws and rules and all because people don't do the right thing. Right. Isn't it a shame? They just don't naturally do the right thing, so we have to put rules in place. It's so entitled. fine. Yeah, and so so it has to be done. It's like, we got to take your phones from you because you don't know to leave them down during the show. Like, really? You know? I, I just, for me, it's lost some of the fun. Well, also, people aren't considerate in general now anyway. I know. And, you know, like, who, who was it? You just said you had to look over someone's shoulder the yeah, whole time. Yeah, I had to look through his phone to watch the show. And one thing you done, were you ever in a band? Did you ever a musician? Did you play anything? In high school, yeah. You did? Yeah, I, you know, I bought a Les Paul when I was like 15. And, 
and was like, yeah, I'm all in on this, you know, and um, because music's just been such a pa passion in my life. And then I kind of like 17, 18, I kind of plateaued out and I was like, yeah, I don't really have the passion to go further with this. And uh, being a big fan of music, I was like, you know, I'm going to let the, the people who do have the passion for it do it for me and I'll just sit back and enjoy it. But I knew I wanted to do something creative. And then it was like years later when I was really starting to get into comics a lot more. And I was like, yeah, that's good. And like, just, you don't have to carry equipment and <laughs> split yeah. the money five True. ways and <laughs> yeah. just put my dick jokes in my pocket and go. And, uh, <laughs> that's cool. Sean, sure, you're, you're still in a band, right? You're still Not still. I mean, like, we were talking about it off air, but like, that's how I got into comedy was being in a, in a band. You know, we, we were a rock band for eight, nine years. And you know, it just fell apart, like not in a bad way. We just, you know, we all went our way and then I became, you know, I found comedy through that. But, you know, we still try and, and play once in a while. Like the last time we practiced, we were covering X-Ray Visions by Clutch. So uh -huh. I'm saying, all right, let me try this. And then the next morning, I'm coughing blood. Oh, my God. Because I'm blowing my voice out by trying to mimic Neil Fallon. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I can't do this because now, like, my money comes from comedy. So I can't screw around being in a, ba a 10 by 10 basement trying to, play Johnny Rockstar at this point <laughs> in my life. I can't lose my voice doing it, but we're, um, you know, we, we get together once in a while. We'll play. You know, I've been writing a lot of other stuff that's just not rock in the least bit. It's going to be more pop country than anything, but so, it's always creative. You always got to keep the creative juices flowing, you know, whatever way it is. Cause. Yeah, you find yourself. I mean, look at Andrew Dice Clay, who I was lucky enough to tour with for 10 years. Amazing. He never wanted to be a comic. He wanted to be an actor. Yeah. Oh, right. And he just, there was, he just wanted to find a way to be noticed. And he was great in A Star Is Born. And so, right. So now, it's so crazy now, you know, late 50s and the early 60s, he's doing exactly sure. what he wanted to do to begin with. But in the meantime, he became the biggest comedian in history. Absolutely. So it's just, you know, we find our way eventually in this thing. Yep, sure. um, whether it's music, whether it's, you know, if you, if you are a artistically inclined in terms of painting or sculpting or anything we like that there. if you're a musician or if you you're blessed with a great voice um, and you find it hopefully you find it you do I mean yeah. I also think you you have to be versatile I think that one of the things that I've learned to keep a career over as long as you know you do is you have to kind of you have to adjust you have to pivot it's like so maybe this isn't one thing isn't working but you still want to be creative you start doing something else you find expression we were saying you just have to express yourself sometimes sure. you know and you find ways to do that whatever that looks like you know now so, when you were in when you were with antigone rising were you guys more of a collaborative writing style or were you doing a lot more of the writing of the lyrics? i wrote pretty much all of that first record i wrote the whole thing okay those songs were written before i joined the band even so I, wow. those songs were all written on that first record from the ground up um when i was living in california I had written them and I had a band in LA, but at the time, and it's kind of this still this, the same situation sometimes for artists. You have a band that this is what they do for a living, so they can't necessarily like come out with you and, and not get paid. Like they have yeah. to, you know, they have their bills to pay. Sure. So I had a really tough time keeping a band together in Los Angeles, even though I think a lot of them liked the music. It was hard for them. They had a big overhead, whatever. They had other opportunities. Antigone was looking for a singer. And they had actually heard those songs recorded in demo form mm -hmm. and somehow got them. I don't know if it was like through my manager or something. They asked to meet with me and then I ended up joining that band and they took all, we took all the songs and yeah, sort of adapted them for that band sure. and then made that record. You had a couple demos though before that. I right? did. I had a couple things before that. Um, nothing that really was like things that people started to find after the fact, which is always kind of how it goes. You know, okay. nothing that I really released big, but yes, some things that people sort of got their hands on after. Now, it's From the Ground Up was your was your major label, but you guys did a couple like independent releases before that, We right? did. We did a live record called um, Traveling Circus that was from um, a place called Revolution Hall in Albany. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if even it's, if it's still there. I don't think it is. I think it's closed now, but that, that was great. And that that one was probably like right when things were starting to break really big. We ha we weren't signed yet, but we were starting to sell a lot of shows out. Like it was just like that that electric moment. Yeah. I almost feel like that was when we were the most perfect in the sense that what, no, nobody what had gotten there. Are we talking about here? I would say. Let me think for a second. That was probably like. 2000 maybe three or four was when things were like starting to just really blow up but we didn't get our record deal yet just before anybody got their and hands the, uh, on us in 2004 you know? i don't remember that far. are they still selling records like was that like a thing or was now is it become like an end no that was, was hard that, copy that, that was hard copy cds oh yeah and not only that 
I would say our, I always say, I literally am the last person that got a publishing deal. You know what I mean? Like I, we, our band was literally the last band to like get like a decent sized record deal. Like all that stuff stopped right. pretty much after 2007, 2008. Like once we got our, we got a nice publishing deal, we got a nice record deal, but people stopped getting like deals like that after us. Cool. Well, so what, what's going on now, Don? What do, you, what do you have? You have a new uh, CD out. Cool. Yeah, I, I, I actually got a record deal with a heavy metal label, which that's you know, so cool. Metal Blade Records. Yeah. Oh my God, that's that's like the coolest thing in the world, though. Yeah, this this label that um, has shaped my musical taste since I'm a teenager. How cool! That's so awesome. Um, and um, great album art on on this CD. <laughs> yeah, really. love well, the, that. well, the, you know, we we've been you know talking earlier about um, the packaging, right, with all this stuff, and I always tell people like, you know, I parody all my favorite bands with my comedy CDs. Yeah, I've done Judas Priest, I've done Thin Lizzy, I've done Led oh, Zeppelin, cool. now Saxon. But you don't have to like any of those bands to get what the content of the album. You right. know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, this is it's it, this is comedy with a rock and roll attitude. You oh. don't necessarily have to like any of those bands to to understand what's going on in the album. And uh, but I but for the people who do, they get a little extra humor. And and again, the packaging to me is so cool because I grew up with vinyl, and I you know that's important. You Big did time. something really great on that on 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 your credits on that. Yeah, Don Don's a beast, right? You know, yeah. he'll, he'll, I see him all the time at Greenwich. He plays Monsters of Rock, right? But he also works out stuff at Mike Bonner's room in Station. And this is like a guy who runs like a little room in New Jersey, but, you know, gives comics a chance, puts people on, and you thank them on your line of notes. I saw that. It was very cool. I thought that was like such a great thing to do, man. The guy really super appreciated it. Yeah, well, you know, um, you know, when you're out doing this for a living, um, you know, people are expecting you to go up and deliver laughs for an hour. And so you're not trying to, you know, I mean, you could fit in some new stuff, but, you know, it, that's a place where I could just go down with 20, 25 minutes of brand new stuff and just go through I it. I love that. And I literally just go through with the notes and go, nope. Right, that's nope. good. Work. Just did the right. same thing. All right, Friday that's night. good. Yeah. yeah. No, that's this needs no work, good. maybe a little bit, yeah. So it's like a little bit of a safety net in, yes. a, in to try to work out new stuff because um, you know, I'm, there's there's people who are super prolific, same with musicians, right? Like, oh my god, he's got 12 new songs already god, and they're all great. And then there's other people like it takes them 4 years to get 12 new songs. And I'm sort of in the middle in terms of comedy, like not as prolific as some guys you know, much more prolific than other guys. I wasn't looking at you for that part necessarily. <laughs> but, um, but, but you know, there's a place to work this stuff out in hunks where you can sure. sort of get it done because the opposite of what bands do is when comedians put out an album, like you guys, we put a musician puts out an album, they want to play the songs from the new album. Right, and people right? want the hit. Comics, you put the album out. You're done. They're done. Did. This material's shot. Oh, right. So you can't tour it because they just bought it, so they're going to buy the album. Yeah. And then I don't want to do this material and then go buy the CD. Oh, They'll go home and go, I just heard it. It doesn't get the same effect. That's the interesting. The joke, three, five okay, times. When the rabbit's out of the hat, it's over. So exactly. They say that about specials, too, like when you put something on Netflix or something. Same, same thing. thing. Yeah. Same concept. Okay, that makes sense. And so, um, you know, there's a, a few little hidden gems where I go and try out new stuff, and it's been great down there. So I thank Mike on here because a lot of this stuff was born in there. I've done that and room. failed miserably. Oh, listen, That's I've done good. that room and too it's to work to have out places stuff. like that too that don't aren't so worried about like you know they let you come in and just do your thing. It's, there's a it's bit on here. Like there's that. a bit on here called "Hit by a Bus," and man, I did this at Mike's place probably. Oh, well, Wait, he, he's be, probably be, only seen it seven do, or eight times. Before you do, describe the to, to the people listening the crowd that goes to station. Oh man, I, um, <laughs> older. Yes, much older. Um, obviously, they don't know heavy metal. Well, that's okay. That's they, okay. They they're don't. there for the food. Are they there to they're see there comedy or no, what? They'll go see comedy, so, but they're also eating at, at the same yeah. time. So, so it's, it's like a rest. It's, it's more a free of, show. Got you. It's a it's a free, it was a free show every Friday night for God. He's been doing it for five or six years, I think. Yeah, now he's done over two hundred shows. That's awesome. But you know, when you go to a comedy show, if you invest the twenty dollars into the ticket. You're invested in the show. Right. When it's They're free. also there and it's free, you're working. <laughs> right. You're which working. is why I, which no is stage. why I don't mind if stuff doesn't. <laughs> oh, really? Exactly. Yeah. It's good to be here on this floor in front of you. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. And this man, I this bit, I, man, it's it haunted me. 
and uh, my, and I had done it in the, the regular clubs. I had squeezed it into my regular paying gigs, like, you know, bullied it in between two really good bits. Sure. Could not get a laugh off this thing. Even Mike was like, he goes, there's something there, I know, and you keep trying it, but, man, it just, it, it's not, and I go, it doesn't get anything, I know. I know there's something here, and I did it over and over at his place, and then I just woke up one day, and I was like, I got it. I figured out what I'm missing on this one, and boom, I had it. I, and I was so it's happy feeling, to put this yeah, in on the really album, is. only for just to for just to show him. Oh, no, okay. even more for for me, oh, yeah, also, but just to show him, like, That's cool. thank you for letting this joke bomb a half a dozen times in your place before I finally figured out how to make it work. So how does and it's one of my work? favorite bits now. So how does this work? Do you record, like, multiple shows and then decide which one was the best night? I did, I did, on this one, I did two shows. Where did you okay. record this? I recorded it in Los Angeles in a speakeasy. Wow. wow. How That's cool. cool. A, an illegal club, yeah. I that, love that. That my friend owns, yeah. That we had to, you know, s uh, set up a Facebook event page, and then we had to email everybody the morning of with the address because really we didn't cool. want to blast it out because they would have got shut down. And, um, oh, yeah. and uh, it was a cool scene, you know, full bar and seats and great sound system and a stage and everything. And um, we did the two shows. And, cool. um, you know, with... You know, have you, I don't know if you've done an album, but um, whether you I've re recorded three, never released them. So whether so I was never happy with them. That's funny. Which you got to get over that. <laughs> Which True is story. <laughs> no, that and that's good. I mean, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to do them. I was. I put the cart before the horse. Definitely. Right. I was like, I would think I was a year in. I'm like, I'm gonna record a CD, right. and everybody's like, you're out of your yeah. mind. <laughs> but then I waited till like I was four years in, and even five years in, I was, I was nowhere near ready. But I'm gonna do one in May. I'm gonna record one in May. And so whether you, uh, I feel like whether you record. Um, you know, maybe it's the same with music, but um, I feel like if you record, no matter how many shows you record, I like to just, uh, there's like one show, that's the show. Right. Like, okay, the, the second show was the show. You, yeah. And then you sprinkle, and it's you like go, all right, takes. I had a little better delivery the first yes. show on this show. It's like vocal takes and or then like that. Yeah. Right, exactly. So you do mix and match, but I've, you know, I've recorded as many as four I, and I've as few as two. And it's always the same. It's 95% one show. Yeah. Because even if I flub something, I, if there's a rhythm going, I don't want to interrupt it. Yeah. But this is great about that. a live album, too, like a real live album. Yes. The little bit of mistakes where it doesn't always. sound like the, the, the record. That's what was great about Aerosmith when they had like their live album. Live bootleg. Yeah. You could hear. like It wasn't the same as listening to like a studio record. No, no, because you can't fix anything. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's why, remember, remember like... Uh, I used to go down to Bleeka Bob's. Oh, yeah. And I remember, oh, absolutely. I remember in the white cover, they would have the uh, bootlegs. Yep. And you would listen to live recordings. And it was live. And that was great. I, that was the, so that's why I don't mind if a band doesn't sound exactly the way they do. I want to hear the mistakes. I want to hear the imperfections. I used to, I used to go up to a place called Things from England in Cliffside Park. I and they, remember that and they had a, a, a cassette yeah. rack. And I'm a huge GNR fan. So I would go and I'd buy all these... I had like November Rain before, like four years before wow. they recorded it, and it was just Axel on a piano. I had, yeah, I love that. I had I Guns N' Roses covering, Guns N' Roses covering Jumpin' Jack Flash and Heartbreak Hotel and oh, yeah. Shadow of Your Love before mm -hmm. it even even knew it existed. Those things were just. And now it's like people can just go on and, and, and yeah. type it up in front. I took a bus, yeah, to a different county. To get these things. Yeah. And like that's the beautiful thing about the era that we grew up in is that there were these things you had to you keep to going down this road. And, and it was it's special. Like that's mm -hmm. the thing. I had a ton of I had a ton of Pearl Jam bootlegs. Like again, I was a huge fan, but I had a ton of Pearl Jam bootlegs and it was like he did this song called Reverend Dave, which was just this acoustic like cover song that like you never got any place else, but there was this one record that he was doing it on and it was just so amazing. And I knew I was one of the only people that had this thing, you know? Right. And that's, yeah, you're right. It's what made it special for, for sure. For years, I thought it was called Yellow Diabetic instead of Yellow Lead Better. <laughs> I had no idea. Because it was a kid that's in my- That's projection, well, Sean. There was a kid in high school who was a huge Pearl Jam fan. And yeah. like I had heard the song once or twice on K-Rock and he goes, this is yellow diabetic. I'm like, what, what? I don't know what it was, but he played, they yeah. learned the song yeah, before I right? even had a copy of it. And I think it was like five years ago, I thought it was yellow diabetic. I'm an idiot. We talk about this on the show sometimes, but um, growing up in college, I put myself through college by owning a record store. Oh, wow. I owned it in, rec in uh, Staten Island. It was called First Time Records. Wow, cool. And I had Twisted Sister come down oh, one, my one time God. to do a little uh, record signing. 
Yeah, yeah. love them. Uh, but I never was able to get the boot. I would have loved to have sold the bootlegs there as well. Yeah. Oh, it was great. I sold a lot of like, you know, metal stuff. I also, because I wanted to make money, I also sold a lot of the disco 12 inches. Oh, you know, yeah. To, to DJs and mixtapes and stuff. You must have a good uh, vinyl collection. I did. I got rid of it. Did oh, you? I did. Yeah, you know, when when you're, you're moving all around a lot, it's, it's, it's hard to store that stuff. I put it in storage, yeah. Yeah, mine's yeah. in storage. Uh, I have to get you know, mine I, I just bought foresight. a new record player. I have to keep a vinyl Excel spreadsheet for whenever <laughs> I go. I do. I have this it right cards, here. bro. I, yeah, cards, I have it right here. Do. No, I'm old school. I have the old school Excel spreadsheet. So whenever I go shopping, I have to actually scroll so through to see. Because you, you know how many times I've bought a duplicate? Yeah. I, I got it three times already. I'm not getting burned oh, yeah. again. I a found Astral good, though, Weeks have. Van no. Morrison. I, oh, I used to vinyl. love that. It was amazing. Which no, one? but Discogs. Astral Weeks. D- oh, Discogs the best, yeah. gives you, like, you know, all the metrics of it. And it shows you what pressing it is and yeah. whether it's, you know, like I have stuff that I didn't know. With, like I have you still have vinyl? Pa- oh, tons of it. Yeah, you I do. Guessing? Yeah, I just I was just saying I just got um, Astral Weeks Van Morrison. I just found it and it was like. Such I was actually original. in a record st- the original, yeah. I was wow. in a record store in Philly. Yeah, amazing. South it sounds Street. great wow. too. It's like not scratched. Vinyl Alter? Uh, no, Vinyl Alter is oh, great. So an, it's another store right on South Street. It's right next to Tattooed Mom. There's a great bar mm-hmm. there. And they have like a dollar basement. You just go down the basement and you just start digging, right? You just start digging. And I'm on the last uh, crate. And I'm like, I'm getting tired. The mildew smell is killing oh, me. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> so I flip through and I see Terrence Trent Darby's first record. It was a dollar. I'm like, Boom, I'm That's taking a good that. one. That's the one with Dig- Wishing Well, right? Yeah. Oh, so then yeah. I'm flipping through. I was working with CBS It'll Records at the time. And I see it. Meet the it's Beatles. So I'm like, yeah, I already have it. But you know what? For a dollar, I'm grabbing it. Oh, yeah. I bring it upstairs, and the guy's like, where'd you get this? And I said, it was in the basement. And he goes, in the dollar basement? And I said, <laughs> yeah. Whoops. And he flips it over. It was a first pressing. <gasps> get out of beat, the, oh. beat the shit, but he had to sell to me for a yeah, dollar. So I still have a first, a first wow. edition of yep. Beat the Beatles at home. That's yeah, incredible. That, that's cool, man. Yeah, that's absolutely. Fine. See, we, we, we don't download stuff and go, hey, let me see the air. No. Yeah. That you just bought. Exactly. Oh, guys- is that first air pressing? <laughs> I like, know. That's right. what's great about the physical product. I, I love that, man. Me too. It's so great. Ugh. Are they selling this um, CD in the at the record store in Greenwich? Is that record store right around the corner from Greenwich Village Comedy Club? No, like so. Right now, it, it, the, the physical copy's not in any record stores. Um, it's just available digitally. But at, at my gigs, I'll have these, and I am going to make vinyl. So that's pretty oh, that's cool. Pretty yeah, cool. I'm going to do make it those, too. I think that's available. pretty cool. Well, yeah, what do you got going on? I have a new record. I was, I mean, I left my band. So Under we, your name? We talked about my band, but yeah, I left the band in 2008. And since then, I mean, I've done a lot. I was writing for other people. I wrote to- songs for Demi Lovato and Ellie Goulding and um, Nick Perry and lots of people. And that was super fun, but I missed it. I missed doing it myself. I needed to miss it. So I needed to take some time. And I've put out a couple of records since just trying things, but I'm really proud of this record. Um, the artwork's not even done yet. I just gave you guys a couple of advanced copies, but... Um, yeah, it's Cassidy and the music is, is what I'm calling myself, the, my own thing. And the record is called All Good Things. I just released a single, um, Kill the Lights, Lights. which is fantastic. I've played it like 17 times already. Where where are you performing? People want to come see you. So I'm all over. So, so I do a few things. I have, I have a show in Boston at City Winery. I have, um, the Catherine Hepburn Theater in Connecticut. I've got... Some things coming up solo, but I do. I'm also doing a symphony show. Women of Rock. Women Rock, oh, nice. yeah, and it's killer. What, what, do- what, what, what talk about so that? So this a is bit. amazing. So this was crazy. I actually let. I'm. I'm also so okay. I'm doing a movie this summer called Parallel Worlds. I'm starring in a movie. I just found out, and wow. I was doing a. I was doing the play version. It's an original script. It's a rock <laughs> musical. I was doing the play in Los Angeles. And got a call. I went home. I was done with the play. I wasn't sure what I was going to do next. I knew I probably wanted to come back east. I'd been in L.A. for a long time. I got a call from a casting director. She didn't even know if I was in town. But I happened to be in town. She's like, will you come in and sing for this thing? There's this producer putting on this show. It's called Women Rock. And, you know, like, I could have, I was a little bit wary. I had never sung anybody else's music. I always sang my own music. So I was always like, oh. She goes, you know, the money was really good. She said, but it's a really cool show. It's going to be a rock symphony in front of symphony orchestras. And it's going to be three female singers, all different. So there'll be a there'll be a sort of Aretha Franklin, Tina Turner singer. There'll be a rock singer like Janis Joplin and sort of, you know, um, Pat Benatar and Hart and that kind of thing. And then there's going to be like a Joni Mitchell, Carole King. I thought for sure they were calling me for the rock stuff. They wanted me to come in and sing for Carole King. I was like, 
Okay. So I went in and I auditioned and it was a massive audition. And they had the lead, the girl who was doing beautiful on Broadway came in and auditioned for it. Oh, oh. And I thought, there's no way. Like, first of all, I'm not famous for my auditioning. Like, I'm not good at it. I can't stand that feeling of walking into a room and there's a table of people all staring at you. You don't know. But their vibe was really good. Like, they were chill and like it wasn't nerve wracking and I was prepared, you know, and it was what easy song enough. Did you sing? So I had to sing So Far Away. Oh, wow. Which was, right? Off of uh, Tapestry? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So all the songs off Tapestry, right? Sounds so, like a dad joke. <laughs> what do you want me to say? I'm so far away, son. <laughs> yeah. So I sang, I got the show, so that was amazing that I got it. I didn't know what that necessarily meant, but I relocated back to the East Coast, and I've been doing that, and I've been writing um, a lot of songs. I recorded this with Mark, who's my partner in life and also in the music, and I'm super proud of it, but in the meantime, the producers of the play called me and said that they want to make it out of a, they want to make a movie out of the play. That's fantastic. So I'm going back to LA to shoot a film this summer. Yeah, it's LA exciting. is the greatest place in the world. It is and it I love isn't. It. I live no, there I forever. Love it. Uh, I, I know love it. because you don't live there. Yeah, I was no. say, well, I yes, there. I assure you. Yeah, did I, you live there too? Well, no, but I've spent tons of time yeah. out there, and I will say, and especially when we were doing that metal show, you, there there is definitely an expiration date. When it's not awesome anymore. Yeah. It's I awesome. It, it is. It, I needed to get out of it. It's an awesome place when you know you're coming home. Yeah. It's See, funny. I love it. That's a, I, when great, you know that's you're a great leaving eventually, it. Mark it's wants so to good. go. He loves it too. I keep trying to tell him, like, babe, it's, it's fine, but it's, there's something, when you're used to dealing with real people, when you're East Coast, you can't get that out there. There's something you don't. It's every, it, unfortunately, it's every stereotype. It is. That it's, it's known for and worse. You know, I never saw that every time I'm out there. I always seem to hang what was out the with time you were there. Yeah, because you it's never see It's a good comedy like scene, days. though. I will tell you. No, that. not even for comedy. Like, I'll go to the Rainbow and sit at the bar at the Rainbow for days on end. Sure. Just <laughs> hanging out. We had, a, we had a great story. We were out there just hanging out at the bar, and we hear this horrible motorcycle getting, it's just loud and obnoxious, and he pulls up, and it was Wes Scantlin from Puddle of Mud. Mm -hmm. So he just moved the seat over. He was like, ah, how are you, man? And we're sitting down, we're bullshitting, and there was a girl who was at the end of the bar, gorgeous, gorgeous woman. And I was like, what do, what do you do? She goes, I'm the whiskey ambassador for the country of Canada. And I'm like... <laughs> You have the greatest job of <laughs> all time. And I'm like, what are you doing here? She goes, I'm only here for like, you know, there's some sort of convention. I'm representing the country. And I go to Wes. I'm like, you need to sleep with her. And he's like, nah, I don't want to do that. So like, we're just trying to hook them up the whole time. We're doing it. Like, we're just literally playing matchmaker between this beautiful girl and the singer from you Puddle of Mud. And he dropped the 50 and bought our drinks and left with her. Wow. So like, I love the rainbow just for that reason. It makes love. Yeah, it helps it to be in Puddle love. of Mud. Yeah. Well, that's true. Hurt. I don't think she knew who it was, though. She had no idea who it was. But I, I love it because, like, even in New York, you can blend in a little more. You know, L.A., people just... It's more of a scene. Yeah. Like I would say, the difference between New York and L.A. is, you know, like, when I lived in the East Village, you know, if, if I wanted an apple at four in the morning, I could get up, walk, walk, to, walk down my steps in my pajamas, go to the deli right on the corner, 10 feet away, buy an apple on back of my apartment and, like, under 90 seconds. Say, yeah, like LA, you got to shower, do your hair, <laughs> your makeup perfectly, put on trendy clothes, go down into the car park, take your car to the garage, drive to the one Ralph's that's open 24 7, because you got to be made up in case there's an God agent forbid. who's getting an apple at the same time. Yeah. And, and two and a half hours later, you're back in your apartment. Did you notice one that's thing, the difference. One thing about LA is they closed everything very early in Too LA. Early, yeah. Like Barrier. one o'clock in the morning, the whole city rolls up. Yeah, because everyone drives. And that's also the difference between New York comics and Los Angeles comics. New York comics are grittier. They're great. Oh, they, yeah. they're, they're doing yeah. it because they want to be comics. They want to be funny. I think LA comics use comedy as a vehicle yeah. to get a write, writing job, uh, an acting job, to be in a right. movie or exactly. something. Yeah, TV show. Yeah, everybody. A lot can, of them are looking for that. Sure, they cut their teeth out in New York, and then they try and go out to LA to get to the next level with. You know, movies. It's or a TV good community, though. I was in the. I was. I did improv. I was on the other side of it, but it's. A, it's a solid community. The the, the 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 comedians, the the comedy clubs, and sort of the the improv clubs are are happening. Man, there's a lot. There's going some on. really good comics out there, yeah. but yeah, as a general rule, exactly. yeah, I, I agree. You know, I yeah. think, and maybe it's just my preference as a, as a fan of comedy. I moved that I do prefer. You know, the edge of the East Coast. Oh, I do too. And that's what I want to ask you. So, you're going to be in this movie. Have you done any acting before? Yeah, yeah, I have actually. I 
Well, I'm, I graduated from, I went to the new school. I also went, as I said, to UCB, Upright Citizens. Mm -hmm. I did improv. So that was, you know, an amazing foundation. I did a lot of teams and did a lot of that stuff out there. Um, I've done a lot of plays and I did a couple of small parts in movies. I did a movie with Zoe Saldana called The Skeptic. Um, but the music always was like what paid the bills. Right, it was sure. so I always loved acting and it's funny I don't know who's saying it but like sometimes oh you're saying about Andrew Dice Clay that he wanted to be an actor and then he got into comedy and then it's sort of how it goes full circle. I would have probably done acting if I thought that my life would support that, but I had to like make money and I could sing and I didn't need anything to do it. I could just go someplace and sing. I played guitar, I wrote songs, but I knew that I could make money quick. Did you take lessons? No. No, I was self-taught. That, that always amazes me. Yeah, I'm self-taught. Although, you know, it's funny because the higher up you get in the business, like, for instance, doing these, like, symphony shows now, like, even my boyfriend, like, he's a Berkeley graduate. He plays, like, 57 instruments. He's, like, a genius. You realize your limitations, right? Like, you, so sure. you start getting around people who can sight read or whose ears can are amazing. Read? I can't. So I have to, in some ways, I almost have to be better because I have to be so quick. I have to come in and like assess it and I have to have my own way of learning. What they don't know is that I just spent two days like in a room, like shedding the music so hard where like someone like Mark can just walk in and like look at it. You so know, if you're going to play a cover song, right? Yeah. You listen to the song and you, you just have the natural ear yeah. where you can hear that song, yep. pick up a guitar and play those chords and you just know how to do that. Usually, or I will pull up the the chords, not tabs. So if it's tabs or like music notes, I can't read it, but if it's just the chords, what, what did, then yeah, yes. What do they call that when, when you'd buy like that sheet music? It wasn't sheet music. With, with like the, tablature. tablature. Yeah, 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 tabs. So like in other words, there's a way, if you see the actual notes, then I prob then I can't read it. But if it says D, G, E minor, sure. F, I can read that. Like I can play that. Gotcha. But Mark doesn't have to even know the song, hear the song. He can look at it. You could read cough it. and he'll tell you what note it is. It's like the most. Hate people it's like a, that. It's obnoxious. Oh my God. Thank yeah. God he's not in. It's, a, it's obnoxious. <laughs> yeah, I bet he's good looking. Has a and he's cute penis and he's too. lovely yeah. and yeah, Shit, well, yeah, yeah. and that. Yeah, no yeah. But you know what? It's and there's there's people of that have different strengths than other people. Totally. And so it doesn't. It de I always say it doesn't diminish anything. No, that you have because the first to say it. because you know Lady Gaga is a headlining act and so are you. You know the right. three of us are headlining acts in comedy, but so is Chris Rock and Kevin Hart. Right. We might obviously have you know draw different crowds. Sure. And and maybe and maybe and I don't know maybe we're it's just as funny as Kevin Hart or maybe we're not. But it doesn't matter. But the the point is some. People are stronger at different things, yeah. and that's okay. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like it's, once, it, some people are stronger as a performer. Yeah. Sure. Some people are better writers. Well, I realized that too. That yeah. what a I think that after I left the band is when I probably realized that my writing was such like was a talent. Like it was just something that I did. I didn't realize that. How it many was, years were you in and in Ticket Rising? Gosh, probably eight eight years in the end. Yeah, close to eight years. Um, maybe like yeah, seven or eight. But I, I think leaving, realizing that that is not something everybody knows how to do. Write a song. Sure. Yeah. That's the one thing I, I see with bands is they're missing a songwriter. Yeah. You they they got 20, they got 150 songs, but they don't really have any like, songs. The lead singer can sing. He's a good looking guy, but right. they need the songs. They can play their instruments, right. but they have no songs. I know. You're, it's tough. I want to go back to, why didn't Saxon ever make it big in the United States? I mean, they, they clearly were able to write songs. They, I they, agree. They I think sounded, they're, I, mean, I think they're good songwriters, and I think yeah, they've adjusted with the times, but without, without losing the core of what they do the best in terms of their sound. But um, yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, I think just um, you know they never. A lot of bands this happens with, and this might have happened to you over the years. Is you know, and it's sad that sometimes they want you to fit into a certain box, and if you don't, they don't know what to do with you. It's awful. and and then and. Like if I if I'm someone in the music business and someone or the comedy business and someone doesn't fit into a box, I, I'm I'm grabbing that person right. and holding on You're for so dear sad. life. Yeah. I agree. But but you know like I've tried to sell a bunch of TV shows over the years and I've come up with great ideas um, for stuff um, for television. And but but the thing the, the feedback you get is like, well we don't really know what to do with it. Yeah. We don't have anything to pair it with. It's the same like, thing with music. Oh my God. Where, where no, 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 play no. It? Big time. This, this, you put this on and then you find something to pair with this. Oh no, when the right. president of the label you know, looks at you and says, have radio something doesn't original. play chicks, you know. Yeah. They don't play chicks, sing, they, they don't play rock and chicks. It's like, oh, But do, right. you, do you have more outlets now to be able to like, you know, between streaming, between Hulus and- Yeah, there's definitely, there's you know, definitely a lot more like- yeah, yeah, but, they, but, they, but they all say the same thing. Really? They, they all say the same thing. 
uh, or they just take your idea, which has happened many times. Yes, I bet that's happened that I've too. Heard a lot. Oh yeah, but I've it's like, what are you going to do? You know, it's the same as someone takes one of your songs. Without a it's doubt. like, okay, well, I could just either write another song, which is probably the better thing to do, so you don't have all that negative energy in you. And I mean, unless obviously you're making a living on the song, but um, same with the TV idea. It's like when someone steals, it's like, all right, you know, what am I going to do here? Am I going to hire a lawyer and sue a network? And how much what time did you do the first time you that, that that's happened what to you? Saying, and I agree. Yeah. It's like too much energy to give to something negative. I, yeah, I just didn't, you know, it was, it was, I was just like, you know what? I did, it's just. Let it go. You were that calm? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy, man. You, you, you're a good person. Well, you were kind of in a similar situation, too, Very when, you, much so. when you were leaving the band as well. Big time. Why don't you talk about that a little I bit? I had to fight. I had. So when I left the band, um, you know, it was an interesting situation because we were very successful. We were doing very well. But the inner workings of the band, unfortunately, we weren't successful. We didn't get along. And we were putting out, I think, the projection that we got along. And it was a toxic atmosphere. And I just, I needed to leave. But because I um, come from a family, like the Omuerta, like you don't, you don't talk, you don't talk about things. Like right. I never told Were anybody. Were you making money with Antigone Rising? Um, not as much as people thought. We got some nice. Because that's got to be hard if you're making money to walk away from a toxic I was making situation. money. I was making money in that it was steady money. But I wasn't making a lot of money. I had made a lot of money that I gave away to the band, like publishing deals, record deals. We split. Even though they were my songs, we still split everything. That was what was right because we were all doing it. 250 shows a year for years. So everybody gets paid. That's what's correct. But it was a really hard breakup. And when I left, they kept everything. They kept all of the music and the royalties and they kept all of the gear and the van and the and the road cases and the instruments and all the things that all of our... You don't, you don't own the songs anymore? You don't I, get any royalties get, and nothing on them? Not really, no. They've kept a lot of things. And I got to a place where I had to make a decision. Do I move forward or do I spend my entire rest of the 10 years of my career, whatever it is, fighting backwards, mm. swinging backwards, or do I try to just rebuild? And, you know, I chose the latter. It, it was really tough. I mean, financially it was tough. Emotionally it was tough. And I kind of went underground for a while. I disappeared and I didn't talk about anything so i think a lot of people thought i just left the band and didn't give a shit and that wasn't the case i was just what were you doing all that time um i went to los angeles i did have enough money to kind of you know take some time and and disappear i was in los angeles when i joined the band so i went back to los angeles after i left and i started writing for other people ah. yeah so i got there behind you know. this you know so you that was good stayed creative. i stayed creative i was acting i went back to school yeah. and then i was like painting and just kind of being creative it's better yeah it's better to put your mind going forward and go you know what that's just an idea yeah you know what i, yeah. I got a, it's ideas you know look it's a dime a dozen i can i have tons of other ideas yeah let me just move forward I'm not going to focus on trying to sue a network no, and for an idea because they're just going to claim, hey, parallel thought. We right. already had this in development, and then it's you against them. And it's like, you know what? You know, if that uh, Take my idea. If that makes you happy, yeah, and honestly, take my karmically, idea. it's like you just have karmically, to – you yeah. just got to let it go. And I think musically when you look at the band and you and look at what they've done since and you look at the songs that I've put out since, I think it's very clear who was writing the music. I don't think it's – I think in hindsight you can see it now, yep. even though at the time it wasn't necessarily – projected that way that I was really contributing that much I didn't need to like scream it from the rooftops I thought in 10 years everybody will see are you they know? still together there's not only are they still together they still call themselves Antigone Rising they have a very different sound they have a different lead singer and it's not even that I begrudge them that I just don't appreciate being erased from the legacy because there really wouldn't uh, there wouldn't be a career there like had Michael I not Anthony been there Van Halen yeah <laughs> <Right>? exactly <laughs> I'm website, like the fifth Beatle it was like yeah. he was never in the band yeah but now it's well, almost if, like if I you're, don't if you're a Van Halen fan you know he was oh, big part oh, time by that band the way bigger than, yeah. than most fans would know yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, this has been a great, great episode. This has been a great hour, man. Things have just Absolutely. flew by. It's been so um, fun. Thank you. Don, tell us a little bit where you're going to be, where people can pick up denim and leather. Uh, denim and laughter, yeah. That's, and I love that people confuse it, with, it. with Saxon's denim and leather because I'm going to go on. It tour. looks just like. Well, I'm going to go on album. tour with the singer uh, of this band. Oh, Biff? With his solo album, with his solo album and wow, tour in the UK and Europe. And so I'm hoping when I'm selling my CDs after the show, people will think I'm selling Saxon's <laughs> album. Awesome. And I'll get a bunch of Mercy sales um, <laughs> off of that. But uh, yeah, new album, uh, iTunes, Apple Music, like I said, um, Spotify, all, all those places, physical copies at the gigs. And um, you know, I'm on all the socials, Don Jameson, J-A-M-I-E. 
S O N and uh, come out to a show and enjoy. I work with these cats a bunch, and oh, yeah, would love you for you to come out Definitely. and mm -hmm. love to come see you as well. Yeah, good. Yeah. Thank where, you. where could people find you? What do you got going on? So, you, yeah. you, we got the new music. Yeah, here. I didn't do the artwork yet, but that's coming. Um, the artwork is on the stick actually at this point, but I have. Um, the new single is out on Spotify and, and all of the things. It's called Kill the Lights. Cassidy and the music is the way that you find me on all of the socials, um, C-A-S-S-I-D-Y. -S -S and um, I will have shows and everything posted up there on my Facebook or on the Instagram and um, just doing lots of shows and, and have the movie this summer. So keep your eyes out for that. It's called Parallel Worlds. Well, we wish you the best with the movie. We Thank wish you the best you. with this CD. It's awesome. Uh, Sean and I, we're going to start doing this now. Once a week. Yeah, we're going weekly, weekly as of uh, awesome. this episode. Awesome. Yeah. Well, this was super fun. Yeah. And hopefully Thanks, we guys. can finally put that show together that we've been talking we've about been talking for the last year. I would love so. to do that. We could do a combo comedy acoustic show. He said, would you call it Beauty and the Beast? Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> I'm in. Yeah, that's perfect. I'm we in. should do it. I would, great. I, that yeah, yeah. would be so fun. We'll I would love it. We'll finally get that going. But <laughs> yeah. listen, guys, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, keep checking us out. We're on iTunes and Spotify. Spotify uh, and YouTube now, apparently, with episodes, which you get to see the video portion of the podcast. Cool. Uh, we have some great shows coming yeah, up. Yeah, iHeartRadio is coming soon. We'll Excellent. Yeah, we have. Uh, guys. So we'll be going once a week from That's now on. Deep. We have our next episode will be uh, taped in two weeks. Right, because Sean, Sean's a big shot now. He's now a full time comic, and he's going to be going on a cruise, Doing working a cruise. the cruise. Not yes, it's official. He's yeah, be it's official. I'm a full time comedian as of nine days ago. Beautiful. So, Congrats, I man. love that. Oh, yeah, tell yeah, tell me when I got to pay the rent next month. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you guys so much uh, for Jeffrey Paul and myself. Thanks for checking us out, and uh, we'll catch you in a week.